Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for a special edition of the show. So uh, I've driven up here to Dundee, right? Dundee. Dundee, Dundee yeah. Uh, over at Erath. So if you ever want to know how it's pronounced, it's Erath, not Erath, as I've been saying probably for about 10 years now. Um, <laughs> you, this is, you're not the only one. Yeah, this is the benefit to traveling is you learn how to pronounce things <laughs> from the locals. So it's kind of like my last name. So in Italy, it's Fusco, but we pronounce it Fusco. It's just we're about half of our family... Half of the Fuscos in the United States say Fusco, the other half say Fusco. All right. Well, and I'm you, glad I didn't yeah. embarrass myself. Yeah, and if you grow up in Texas, they say Fusco. And I'm like, I don't know where you got that one from. But, <laughs> but uh, so, um, um, I'm here with Gary. <laughs> Gary yeah. I don't who, who? Horner. <laughs> Horner, that's Horner. it, Horner. <laughs> yeah, I had a little brain fart. and was like, who am I with again? Gary. Um, <laughs> and we've been kind of checking out the property here um, and checking out the old house here. And uh, talking about some history and talking about how Gary got into this. So we're going to go ahead and hop into that. So Gary, uh, kind of introduce yourself. What do you do here? And uh, how did you get into this? Oh, it's been a long road. Long road, it yeah. It has been a long road. But I'll start from the beginning. You know, I don't know of too many kids who, when they were 10 years old, wanted to be an anesthesiologist. I, yeah, I don't think I've met anyone like that. Okay, right. So th this was my life. So I, I was growing up at home. I used to live in Seattle with my parents. My dad was a Boeing engineer, but they got Reader's Digest. I don't know if Reader's Digest exists anymore. but I think it does. One of the sections was news from the world of medicine, right? Okay. So I would like wait for that to come, and I'd be reading that. And a 10-year-old, I'm reading about medicine. I read about anesthesiology one day. I went, that's cool. I want to do that. Seriously, right? I didn't want to be a firefighter or a policeman. I want to be an anesthesiologist. Well, came time, made my way through high school. The grades maybe weren't so good. And it was my mom, of all people, who said, um, maybe you should consider pharmacy. It's, it's sort of like medicine. And yeah. I went, great. Okay, I'll give it a shot. I've always been somebody who needed to understand how things worked, right? Uh, mechanically and also chemically. And so I started studying pharmacy uh, and I was pretty good at it. And I ran into a guy, his name was Andre. Mm -hmm. And Andre was part French. He was just out of the Navy, going back to school. Uh, and he had this enormous wine cellar. Now, my family did not grow up drinking wine. I mean, if it was a, a big day, a Sunday dinner, and there was a crock of, what, Black Tower or yeah. Matus Rosé on the counter, it was like, wee! Uh, so I didn't know wine. And so Andre thought there was something about me uh, that maybe would like wine. So he struck a deal. And the deal was that Andre would bring wine to dinner and I'd cook. Now, I got to tell you, uh, as a college student, I was no chef. I mean, we're talking like <laughs> burgers and, yeah. and burnt roast and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So I, I clearly got the better end of the deal. Uh, but Andre, what he decided to do, little did I know, is he was bringing over benchmark wines from around the world. Now, I didn't know regions. I barely had heard of varieties, and I certainly didn't know labels. Mm -hmm. And so he starts at the top. And I go, yeah, great, you know, first growth Bordeaux. Oh, whatever. <laughs> I am not kidding you. So this goes on for God, a year and a half or two years. And gradually, I'm starting to, to notice things. And he was such a gentle teacher. Uh, he brought over a Pinot. This was the first Pinot after a year and a half. And I don't remember the producer, uh, but I do remember the vintage. And the vintage was 1953. It was a red burgundy. And this is how the story goes. Andre presents the wine. He says, now this, this is out of a dead German doctor's cellar. And it's like, <laughs> God, you know, slam dunk, right? And he says, I'm going to open this wine. Oh, but wait. 
before I do, you must know that this wine will live for maybe 20 or 30 minutes. I'm going, what does that possibly mean? So he pulls the cork and he pours a sample into my glass and I look at it and I think, is this a joke? I mean, is this one of those tests where, oh, it's Gary gonna know what this is? Mm -hmm. And it was literally, it was like amber, amber brown. And I thought, okay, baloney. And then I smelled it and it was like forest floor. It still smelled like violets and I jaw drops. And then I tasted it and it was just this mouth filling sweetness in velvet. And damn, if he wasn't right, after about 20 minutes, it was dried up and gone. Yeah. And th at that point in time, I said, I have got to learn how to do that. So all my chemistry, I actually got a doctorate in pharmacy too. So a lot of schooling, Yeah. I just went, well, that's nice. After 10 years, set that aside, quit my job and came to Oregon to work for $6 an hour on the bottling line at Bethel Heights just to see if I could do that. I'm not sure if I can do that yet. So after 30 plus years, I'm still trying. <laughs> so in a nutshell, that's kind of how I got started. I just got real lucky. Yeah. Uh, so when did you start here? Uh, it was uh, July of 2003. Okay. And I had known Dick pretty much since I came to Oregon in 88. I first met him at Bethel Heights uh, at a harvest party. And I had not seen him before. And we're outside. It's a day like this, fall setting. And he's a tall guy. He's taller than I am. And he saunters up and, well, hello, I don't believe I've met you before. And so I, yeah, well, I'm Dick Erath. I go, holy cow, <laughs> yeah. right? And so we talked, uh, interesting guy. He's a real techno geek, brilliant man. And so we share some of this technology interest. And over the years, we kept, you know, running into each other. And I started doing some really advanced and unusual things with red wine fermentations when I was a winemaker down Benton Lane. And uh, that Dick found out about that. And we kept going back and forth. And then in 2003, he made me that proverbial offer you couldn't refuse. Yeah. <laughs> and I dropped everything and came here to nice. be the winemaker for this Pioneer Winery. Holy cow. Nice. So let's talk about the history of of this place and, and you know how much of a pioneer Dick Erath, Erath was. Well, you know, just just think about this. So this industry goes back to maybe 1965. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people give credit to Dave Lett from IRE for really being Papa Pino and find, founding this industry. But he and Dick were friends down uh, in the Bay Area and took courses together at Davis. So, you know, they were they were talking. They were talking. And um, one thing led to another. And it was in 1969 that Dick decided to do what I did, sort of, quit the job mm -hmm. down in California. He was with Tektronix down there in a pretty good position. And he literally loaded up the back of a Honda Civic with cuttings, grape cutting sticks, and came up here and planted a four acre vineyard to I think 23 or 24 different varieties. You know, Lett thought that Pinot was gonna do well up here. Dick thought that Pinot was gonna do well up here, but nobody had anything growing up here. And in fact, all the professors at Davis, who they consulted with, said, you guys are gonna fail horribly and be back in California in five years. Yeah. Well, I think it worked out. Did they, did they think at Davis that something else would work or that this, this was just not a good place to grow this grapes? This was not a good place to grow, grow grapes, too cold and primarily too wet. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so when you start, you look at the weather records going back into the 70s and early 60s, it was pretty extreme. Seasons were much, much later. It was much wetter. Okay. Uh, so it's not like growing grapes in the Willamette Valley today. Back then, that was an enormous challenge. And what I think really made it work was it was guys like Dick and Dave Lett, a few others, Dick Ponzi, Dave Adelsheim. These people came together and shared information. And I know it sounds kind of corny, but it's for real. They shared not just what worked out in the vineyard and in the winery, they shared what didn't work. Mm -hmm. So the next person wouldn't make that same screw up. 
there was nothing up here. People did not know Pinot Noir had it not been for that core group of individuals yeah. and that sharing and that cooperative nature. We may not be sitting here. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's that way today. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of sharing. It's grown enormously. You know, there's some different atmosphere, but there's still that spirit of cooperation. Yeah. Kind of neat. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, uh, so you he did like over 20 varieties, but you've basically whittled it down to, you do you guys do four right now. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do um, Pinot Noir is certainly mm -hmm. uh, what we're most well known for. Um, there's a, a broad based Oregon tier Pinot Noir that people will say, we see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's true. That's the intent. Yeah. Uh, and then I make up to 12 individual single vineyards and some reserve wines of Pinot Noir. We make two different Chardonnays, a reserve tier and also a broader distribution Chardonnay. And if you want to know what gives me the most gray hairs, uh, is the broad distribution Oregon Tier Chardonnay, because that has to be great every year, because mm -hmm. everybody sees it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we uh, well, we have a selection of maybe 12 wines here. Yeah. There's a double that that are really uh, yeah. behind the scenes. Club wines, mm -hmm. you know, that type right. of stuff. And uh, uh, I mean, I understand like with Chardonnay, it seemed like at first that maybe the right Chardonnay wasn't picked. I mean, uh, not picked, but wasn't grown here. And then over the years, you guys have kind of figured it out. Is that? Yeah, that's it, you really have to be careful when you talk about that. Uh, so I, I was on a panel once before with uh, Dave Let's son, Jason, right? And so uh, I had experience with one of those clones. It's called the 108 clone from Davis, which was when they brought it up here, and it was such an extreme climate, 108 Chardonnay maybe ripen three weeks after Pinot. Okay. In the rain, in cold of November. Okay. So, not not when you wanted it to really. Not exactly. No. <laughs> yeah, not, not the best. Uh, and so I made the mistake of saying just that, that that was the wrong selection for Oregon. And Jason just kind of, well, sort of tore me apart because Jason still has 108 to this day and swears by it. Well, it's a different climate today. <laughs> yeah, well, now it works. Yeah. But then, yeah, unfortunately, they didn't know it was going to work well. So the, the um, selections that they brought up were really very, very late ripening. So they got all excited about it. But the wines overall were quite acidic and thin mm -hmm. and really not too, not too exciting unless it was a hot vintage. Okay. Uh, but in the meantime, Pinot, yeah. Pinot Gris was starting to get, get traction much more appropriate selection for this climate at that time and that became the white wine of of uh of oregon right pinot gris and it's not because chardonnay couldn't have had we had those clonal materials and known about that that chardonnay probably would have taken off like pinot gris did yeah i you know my experience really it's only the last year i understood the thing about the whole chardonnay thing because i i would think to myself if this is such like a Burgundian style, I mean, I know we're not exactly the same climate as Burgundy, but you know, we're, we're cooler climate and all that. Why wasn't Chardonnay and Pinot like the thing? And why am I not seeing it? And um, uh, over the, this past year, honestly, I've I've actually had heard people or they've talked or people have talked to me about the really the reasons why. Mm -hmm. And yes, things have gotten warmer, so those other clones are going to do better now but yeah i mean it was like why why hasn't chardonnay been like well, yeah and it very well could have been yeah uh but it just goes back to the whole cooperation thing mm -hmm. on the whole the whole chardonnay selections uh we refer to these chardonnay selections and some of the newer pinot noir selections we call them dijon clones because mm -hmm. they literally were brought over from france from burgundy okay. uh and here's the cooperative thing so so dave adelsheim and one of the professors at oregon state university and a few other individuals within the industry approached this one professor at the university uh in dijon about what we're doing here uh and wh what what do you have maybe right now okay americans talking the french probably not going to go so well right but this is an example dave adelsheim was able to build a relationship just like he did with the Durans. Now the Durans are here with this professor and they gave up some of this material to Oregon State, Oregon State only, to go to the university where the industry planted experimental vineyards of these newer clones of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. We grew them in the vineyard, 
they made wines of, at, at the university and as an industry group, we sat down and tried the wines to see what worked best in our climate. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they were willing to cooperate with us and let that go, they would not do it with California. The Dijon material that's in California yeah. came from Oregon. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Just, just saying. saying, yeah. But that's the whole thing about relationships, mm -hmm. you know. And so the early Dijon material came in in the 80s, and there's been other stuff that's come out. Uh, right. And so the selections now you have to choose from, maybe 20, 23 different selections of Pinot Noir to really work with um, as, as a red wine. Okay. And so the same thing applies to Chardonnay. And once we got the right clones matched up here, uh, it's take it's taken off. Okay. Could have been different had if we had them then, but we didn't yeah, have them. Exactly. So, um, so you guys whittled everything down, and then kind of kind of walked me through when we were talking about how Dick was making the wine and the the, the house we're sitting in right now, and kind of yeah, ah, this yes, <laughs> <laughs> what, what this was. <laughs> what, yeah, well, you can't see what this was, but uh, what it, or or the or the bug in my. <laughs> my cup here. So this is part of living in the woods. It's, you uh, know, it's mog. It's mog. Yeah. If you know what mog is, it's material other than grapes. Yeah. <laughs> just, just part and the other stuff you don't want to know about. Yeah. <laughs> so we're actually sitting in uh, what was originally Dick's home up here in the Dundee Hills, and it's a stick-built home. It's like a log home that he assembled uh, back in 1972. And so the very first wines that Dick made commercially uh, were done right here in the garage. Uh, this was like, it was either six or eight barrels of wine. Maybe mm -hmm. it was like two, 250 cases. And that's where it all started, literally 10 feet from here. Yeah. Uh, now you could say we've grown just a bit in just the last bit, yeah. 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then um, down the hill, you were, you were making wine. You, you were making wine. Well, he was, but you were making wine there too. Uh, and that little, those buildings over there, right? Yeah, the, the uh, so, so as, as the eight barrels grew, uh, Dick added on to the facility where we're at now. And so these buildings go back 40 years. And, and so we're out in the middle of a forest. And so it has a lot of what we like to call rustic elegance. Mm -hmm. Cedar shakes, it looks really neat. Uh, and so I, I made most of our wine here in 2003. And we have grown to such a stage that no longer can I handle the production here. Yeah. We've had a custom crush facility build to our specs, and I make wine actually off-site of that facility, too. Yeah. So I have two offices, one here and another one down the hill. So um, uh, this is a good time for me to, because to, I didn't do it before. We don't say where I work. But in a former, <laughs> but I can talk about anywhere else I've worked in the past. So the, but, yeah, so I worked, so this is how I got into wine. Uh, I worked at a little place called ESPN Zone. It was owned by some small company named Disney. Huh. Yeah. Pretty so, um, so, and I don't know if I've ever told the story on camera. So anyway, uh, I just started getting into wine. I had I tasted a wine at, at, a, at a bar in Chicago uh, that I used to go to every night after work when I worked at Dave and Buster's. And they had they had food there, and I was eating this food. And the bartender, I said, "Give me some wine. If I should drink wine with this." And she gave me wine. And I was like, this one's really good. And she's like, I go, what is it? She was like, it's Red Zinfandel. It's the original Zinfandel. I was Whoa. like, I was like, cool. What is it called? <laughs> and it was like, it was um, uh, Ravenswood, which sadly is basically no longer. Yeah. Um, which uh, I may have mentioned this because when uh, they announced that they were closing the tasting room in May, after Gallo bought everything, I, I bought a bottle of Ravenswood to to kind of commemorate that. I think I kind of said that already. But so. Um, so I'm at, I'm at ESPN zone and we had like this interim GM and, uh, during a manager meeting, he mentions that Disney has more level one Psalms, which apparently some people hate us saying level one, level two, level three, but that's what, they okay, well, that's that. yeah, I, yeah, I still use it. Um, level one sommeliers than any other company in the world, because almost every server at their restaurants that are on property go through the, a course and then they take the quartermaster sommeliers. Uh, intro introductory course and exam. Oh my, I would have had no idea. Yeah, and they pay for that. Oh, better still. Yeah, because <laughs> in, in, in the course, the actual six week course that Disney does is on property for their employees. But what I got told was that I could go and take the exam, do self study, uh -huh. and they would pay for that. So I thought, 
So he goes, if anyone wants to learn about wine, come to the, come to the office after our thing. So I was the only one who showed up. And he said, buy Wine for Dummies. No lie. Wine for Dummies. And I, I still, to this day, recommend that book for someone just starting to learn about wine. Because it's actually really good, like covers a lot of general information. And um, I brought it in. He says, know this stuff for the exam. And then, unfortunately, I didn't get into studying really hardcore until I moved back to San Antonio. That was in 08. So from 05 to 08, I really didn't do a lot of studying. And then this podcast is actually how I studied. Oh, no Starting in 09 to 10, which is when I took my CSW and my, my uh, introductory and passed those. So, oh, but okay. uh, how did I get on this? Oh, I, so, so, so ESPN zone. Yeah. The ESPN zone. So I had three offices. That's what it was. Three offices. It, it so all comes back. Yeah. <laughs> so I was a regular manager. So we had the manager office. And then I, my department was retail and what they call the arena, which is the game room. So, uh, and the ESPN zone was two floors. So in retail, I had an office in retail. It's really just the storeroom and there was a computer. There. That's why I called right. the office. And a stool. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty much. And it was a small little <laughs> desk. Um, and then we had the office that was actually truly my office um in the the arena or the game room but my leads were in that office more than i was but i used to joke that i had three offices because i kind of did <laughs> i had three offices i had three offices like i, had, I was more important than the gm but uh so we, we totally digressed on that so yeah so you you've got um you've got the custom crush so you're making uh the wines there um and uh, so the vineyards here, so Dick had uh, worked with... Um, well, in the early days. In the early days, in yeah. The, yeah. In the old days. In the old days, yeah. Uh, Dick had a partner, and that mm -hmm. was Cal Knudsen. Yeah. So Cal was uh, a big executive at Weyerhaeuser Lumber up in Washington. Okay. So he was he was the dollars, and uh, he went in partnership with Dick, and they planted the vineyard where we're at here, which is called Knudsen Vineyard. They also established other vineyards. Uh, and uh, they they had somewhat of a bitter parting. Okay. Yeah, they weren't the best of friends when they they split up, but split up they did, and mm -hmm. so Dick kept the brand, and then Newtson kept the vineyard. Yeah. So yeah, so if you have those vineyards there, uh, we did we did check them out for, mm -hmm. for like briefest of minutes. Um, uh, you're showing me actually about different trellising systems, so that was kind of cool. Uh, the between cordon and cane. cane. Cordon and Cane. Uh, we also talked about um, where I was at earlier today, uh, their their uh, printing system. And um, yeah, I uh, think it's a good time maybe to pop, a, pop into some wine here. Oh, shall we? Yeah, why not? <laughs> we kind of got, we kinda got the, the uh, history and stuff out of the way. I got that covered. Well, the first line I'm going to start you on would be uh, Pinot Gris. Okay. Okay. Now, the uh, the place of origin on this, I call it Oregon because the fruit is primarily Willamette Valley. I'm going into the wrong glass, but you can, That's you fine. can, you can deal. Um, mostly Willamette Valley fruit, but a bit comes from the Umpqua Valley down in the south. Okay. And the reason for that is there is a vineyard down that way. That brings in a lot of um, kind of peach and apricot into the aromatics that I really love. Okay. Uh, and I really, I don't care about the AVA on a wine like this. Uh, to me, it's all about what ends up in the glass. It's right. fermented dry, though you're going to get the perception of sweetness. And what I'm doing there is I lease to her in okay. tank. It's a pain in the ass for the cellar folk. Uh, but just a little bit of that lee stirring, a little bit of that maturity in tank gives that richness and sense of sweetness. I like that. Yeah. So here's the thing with me in, in Oregon, Pinot Gris as a whole. So in our studies for, you know, our test that we're eventually going to take, Oregon Pinot Gris is a testable grape. And when we bring, when we bring Oregon Pinot Gris to... Um, to tasting group, almost none of us ever get it. Uh huh. I, and, and it's not like we don't get that it's Pinot Gris. We usually get that it's Pinot Gris. We just, for whatever the reason, or I have a hard time. I occasionally get it, mm -hmm. and when I get, it, I feel like like I'm unstoppable that I got <laughs> that I got Oregon Pinot Gris. Um, and um, it's a different producer, but someone likes to bring their wine all the time, and I never get it. Oh, no. I mean, it tastes correct. It's, oh, yeah, yeah. It tastes correct. This, I mean, so that's a long way for me to say, this tastes the way it's supposed to, you know? Well, that's yeah. a relief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, 
And the one no, thing it's I, really nice. The one thing I like, and this is this is a 16, and it's always fun to show a little older Pinot Gris, uh, especially from Oregon, because what I get out of it, maybe after that first year and a half, two years in the bottle, is this honey essence that comes out in the wine. I think is just really yeah. attractive. Yeah, it's like like the combination of honey and apricot. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I think what it is is that so many of us, when we say it's going to be Pinot Gris, we're just imagine going to say Alsace because we say Pinot Gris, we're going to say Italy. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, I guess it's almost like a compliment that we're saying that this is like equivalent to something that we would get from Alsace, you know, like quality I, yeah, level. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's how I feel, and that's how Dick felt too. Yeah, uh, and you know, interesting story. I don't know if you ever are you going to talk to Jason Lett at some stage. Um, I don't have any appointments there. Okay, well, uh, I might. I, I don't know if I'll actually meet him, but I'm going to try to at least stop by the winery for a tasting. It, it would be neat if you could. But yeah. uh, so when I got started up in Seattle, I used to go to wine dinners just to learn and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was Pat Campbell and Dave Lett did a wine dinner at some Italian restaurant, or whatever. And then I heard the story. Uh, and so Dave Lett, the very first planting of Pinot Gris in the northern hemisphere happened three miles from here. And that was Dave Lett planting Pinot Gris. He used to take Pinot Gris to the coast and trade it with the fishermen for salmon. So it's like, <laughs> oh, Pinot Gris and salmon, right? Yeah. yeah, and so that's a little piece of history. People don't know about it. Pinot Gris, North America, started here, three wow. miles from here. But I think they've always thought too uh, that it does have a little more in common with Alsace. Yeah, yeah. No, this is really super nice. Thank you. And this is not expensive, right? This is no. I think it's uh, like, you know like the, under twenty ish. It's well here. It's like sixteen bucks. You yeah. can find it out there on deal for probably eleven something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's nice. Thanks. I like that very much. And it has a screw cap. Thank you. So I'm a big fan of screw caps. I'm glad to hear it. I am, I'm absolutely a big fan of screw caps. I'm not saying that you need to use use it on first growth Bordeaux's. But if you want to, that's fine. Sure could. Um, so just like you you said that you like to like look how, how things work and all that. And we kind of alluded, I kind of alluded to that where I like, you know, I was talking about um, uh, the last place I was at, I was asking uh, Julie about, you know, micron sizes of filters. Mm -hmm. no, not that I really understand all this too much, but... Um, so with screw caps, there was I must I think it was the same guy has a podcast uh, or somewhere along the line about the OTRs and screw caps. That oh, they, yeah. Now you can really sorry we're getting a little inside baseball, but um, the OTRs on screw caps where you can kind of replicate cork oh, yeah. OTRs. There's so, a million different choices. Yeah, so it's not necessarily better to use a cork or not, you know, and and and, and, they, and corks are really really mess not messing they're experimenting with that too yeah so you can yeah you're a nice try but yeah. yeah they're never gonna get there but um <laughs> but just kind of the, the quick and dirty on it you know screw caps are a superior are i tell people all the time, a superior closure you first of all zero taint you can't get cork taint because of cork um it keeps things fresh you can age it though again i'm not gonna say that i, I some, one of the first growths did test it and i don't remember i think it was like lafitte they either currently are still testing it or they've done it. Um, I think they stayed with the cork because it's just more romantic. And well, that's, that's just it. They're driven yeah. by tradition. Yeah, driven by tradition. Some of the first experiments with screw caps were done in the 70s at the University of Bordeaux. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Australia and New Zealand took over. And yeah. It, yeah. Well, that's because they couldn't get good cork. They were, like the, they were literally the end of the line. They were exactly. getting the, the worst quality of the corks. So they were just like... If you're an Italian, um, and uh, we'll just we'll just go with screw cap, Stelvin, if you want to be technical, right? But you know they they want a screw cap, and so you do have really really good Australian and New Zealand wines with screw oh, cap. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I'm I'm like, go ahead, screw cap is awesome. It's easier to open. You don't need to bring. You don't have to worry about if you forgot to bring a um, right. wine opener on the plane. Mine was in my check luggage. <laughs> that's how you do it. <laughs> On to something else? Yeah, let's, let's about, check out something uh, else. How about a Chardonnay? Well, yeah, let's do Chardonnay. Chardonnay, I'll all right. I'll get to the rosé in a bit. But, okay. Uh, this is going to be, again, an Oregon Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. 2018 is the vintage. All right. Look out. Here we come. There you go. 
And the uh, fermentation process is similar here. It's all stainless steel fermented. I do Leaster and tank here as well. Okay. There's a bit of declassified barrel fermented Chardonnay for a certain vineyard in here. So a little bit more complexity. So that's, you're trying to add a little complexity to it? Exactly. Okay. We won't be jumping ahead, but do you primarily use French, American? Do you do a combination of what you want to use? For I, oak? I only just a, it's just a general. I only use uh, French. Okay. French oak from Coopers I've worked with for at least twenty years, and in some for thirty years. So I, I know them. I know what mm -hmm. to expect. Uh, and every once in a while, you know, they somebody talks you into experimenting with something else, and so I buy ten barrels from somebody else. And I go, why did I do that? <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really close with our Coopers. You gotta nice. be, you know, you, you've got a lot on the line here. Yeah. Um, we'll continue that, but let's talk about the wine first. Um, this is pretty much right up my alley on, on Chardonnays. Um, so yeah, you have a little bit of oak aging in there, but it's, it's, it's really not that noticeable. I mean, it's just like you said, it's probably, it's really just adding the complexity. I don't really taste the oak. Yeah, just and. Yeah. Um, and that's my preferred style of Chardonnay. I'm not saying I won't enjoy an oaked Chardonnay. I will, because there's a time and a place for everything. Um, but if I'm gonna, you know, get a Chardonnay, this is what I'm seeking. Is this style yeah. right here? Yeah, yeah. And it, it's a style that my wife and I really are in love with Chablis. Yeah, that. You know, I mean, it's, a bing, <laughs> it's just like that that acidity and and cleanness. Yeah, is what we appreciate. And so I'm fortunate in that I get to make wines in style that I like, and not everybody gets to do that. They're, right. they're dictated to. Mm -hmm. And within this relatively enormous organization, nobody tells me how to make wine. They just let me do it. That's really good. Too. That is yeah. like way awesome. Yeah. So when I I went to Burgundy two years ago, and so. Up until two years ago, I was like, yeah, Pinot Noir, whatever. Oregon's my favorite expression of Pinot Noir. It always, pretty much always has been. But that's because it has that really good, I, I talked about it last episode, but I would tell you, more for you. <laughs> um, it's because it's that really good combination of old and new world, but it's slightly old. I'm playing slightly on the new world side, um, which is funny because I tend to like old world wines better. Um, but the, uh, uh, so I went to Burgundy and I was like, Fine, I'll go there because I, I should. It's like Mecca, right? For yeah. Pinot, at least for Pinot heads. And uh, so my trap, my trip there, I kind of like I got it. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I get why people go bonkers over Burgundy, right? And Pinot Noir in general. But I made sure I had a trip to Chablis and uh, a yeah, trip yeah, to yeah. Beaujolais yeah. because honestly, those are my f and and I, <laughs> those are my favorite expressions of Burgundian wine. I know the Burgundians don't want to. They, they, they want to push Beaujolais aside and Beaujolais is kind of like, yeah, we don't care. Yeah. But it's an <laughs> oversimplification and someone's going to say, no, we get it. No, yeah, whatever. But yeah, I was some of the most excited to go to Chablis and go to Beaujolais. Um, and that was made a side trip to Alsace. That, 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 was, that was cool too. Yeah. But yeah, so this uh, this is like how I like to drink Chardonnay is, is more like this. you know, not, not, not an oak style. Or if it is oak, then it's going to be like all used barrels. I got another one for you too. Mm -hmm. uh, this next one is 100% yeah. barrel fermented. All right. And it's from one of our state vineyards down around Amity called Willakaya. Willakaya, okay. Willakaya. And this is a vineyard that's predominantly on ancient marine sediments. So the soils are relatively thin, kind of droughty. Okay. Uh, but the neat thing about it is it faces a cooling corridor to the coast where the sea breezes come in in the afternoon and really cool it down. Okay. Help keep keeps the acidity. Is that kind of like 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 in California, the Petaluma Gap? Actually, there's something like that over here, up yes, here, right? It's, it's called um, Van Duzer Corridor. Van Duzer, yeah, the Van Duzer yep. Corridor. That's right, yeah. Similar concept. Okay. This is a 2015. It's from a selection I call Le Chois. Okay. So this is the best barrels, I my interpretation, the best. Okay. Uh, from the vintage, from that vineyard. So, yeah, I... Uh, not even just swirling it, you can smell you can smell the you know it's not overpowering on the oak. You can smell it, and that's not even just swirling. It's just like so. Uh, my mentor has told me uh, my master mentor as far as t testing. He's like, you swirl the you swirl the wine way too much. Like you, because I'll sit there and I'll just like do this. And my viewers, especially 
old, long time viewers will see that I, when I talk to the camera, I'm just like, I just do this. As you're talking, you're swirling. Yeah. But since he's told me that, and this has been a while now, I, I intentionally don't swirl as much as I used to. Yeah. I still swirl. I mean, it's just sometimes I'm just like doing this. That's I catch habit, myself. I'm right? like, yeah. Well, he said, he, he said that his, his son, his older son actually swirls his milk because he sees mom and dad. <laughs> I swirl, swirl my water. Right? I sometimes, yeah. I sometimes yeah. go like this to water. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but with that said, oh, uh, so so the Willakai is that is that on Willakenzie soil? I uh, see. It's like being a restaurant manager. You go up to them when they're eating, so they can't complain right. about the food. How do you food? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Willakenzie soil. Okay. There's a bit of volcanic there too, but mostly Willakenzie. Now this is the kind of oak one I like, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God, am I relieved? Yeah. I mean, you know, so there's there's this kind of oak wine and barrel fermented oak, and then there's like you bit into the piece of wood, and it's right. you, know, you have a a, 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 a pad of, you know I've had a a stick of butter in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Again, it's time and place for everything. You know, that's not my preferred style, but I know there's lots of people that like it. So cool, man. You're drinking wine. That's all I care about. Yeah, right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> but yeah, I like this. This is, again, not an over the top. It's got just enough in there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, oak's not a bad thing. It's not an evil word. It's, it's only a three letter word. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> That's great. But and, yeah. And, and for you number geeks out there, it's about 26% of the barrels are new. Mm -hmm. yeah. So not a whole lot. This too undergoes a little bit of lease stirring. Okay. Yeah. I like this. Yeah. I would say this is more like maybe a standard Burgundian mm -hmm. Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say so. Yeah, which I, I enjoy those too. So, yeah. Um, and like a fraction of the price. Right. So, yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, the last two Chardonnays, so what, what do they usually retail for? Well, this Oregon Chardonnay is out there for, you can probably find it for 14 or 15. Okay. Uh, again, if it's on sale or something like right, that. Yeah. And this one is um, winery only and it sells for 50. Okay. Very nice. Yeah. And I only make maybe 200 cases. Okay. Yeah. Super small production. Yeah. Like what? A couple barrels? No, what? Say that'd be 10 barrels? Figure, figure, figure 25 cases of barrel. Yeah, so like nine ish barrels, mm -hmm. whatever. Okay. So, yeah, the last place I was at, they were showing me a, a, a concrete egg, and uh, uh, yeah. Julie said, I was like, she goes, Yeah, it's like 300 cases. I'm like, what? I'm like, really? And in my head, I'm, I'm, to, com yeah. I'm comparing it to a, a single barrique, and I'm like, Well, how many is this? It's just 1,200 liters. I'm like, Okay, well, how many? And she goes, they make me do math. I was like, wait a minute, a case is nine liters. So, like, you know, okay, 300 cases, yeah. <laughs> and um, I was like, okay, that makes sense because a barrel is 225 liters. And okay, it just it just looked so small. Yeah, it was kind of weird. You know, it, just, it looked almost the size of a regular barrel. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, it was deceptive. I think it was because it was black. It was painted black, that's why. Because, you know, That'll black makes it slimming. Yeah. I'm wearing blue today, so I don't know. Well, it still looks fun. Yeah, well, yeah. nicely. <laughs> oh, thank you. I didn't pay him for that. <laughs> so, uh, so what uh, What else do we have here? Well, I got something kind of unusual. I like unusual. That's, that's actually kind of what I like to do. Oh, well, good. Because this is it. All right. No, I'm not showing you the label okay, first. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I'll do this. That's good. So, how's it going? I can't see it on the I, it, the, the screen. Right. I can't see it because <laughs> I have my I have my hand over it. Okay, so vintage 2016. Okay. Wine number wine number this is the fourth wine number four is a white wine. Yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Way to go. Nailed it. Actually, sometimes we do that in our tasting group. We we were joking around. We like. Wine number three is a white wine. Nailed it. Yeah, I'm done. When when we're just having we're just having a hard time like identifying stuff. It's Willamette Valley, North okay. Willamette Valley.
Pinot Noir. What? Yeah. I was going to say Pinot Gris, honestly. Yeah. Because uh, it tastes more like a Pinot Gris than a Chardonnay. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, so here's the thing. When, when, <laughs> when you're getting blinded, sometimes in your head, you, you're supposed to just use the grid and like ignore anything else you may or may not know. But I also know they only make four grapes here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's in my head, it's, well, it's either Chardonnay or Pinot Gris or Pinot Blanc, I guess. So I'm like, he hasn't given me the Pinot Blanc yet, but maybe it's Pinot Blanc. I think it's Pinot Gris, but it's, which is, they're all the same. Not really. Well, they are really, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're all just quite... different mutations of exactly. each other. Exactly. So a white Pinot Noir. So I was actually supposed to try that the last place, not initially on camera, but we forgot to do it. So. Oh, shoot. Okay. So, but well, um, this not? is my first ever white Pinot Noir. So tell ah. me how you do it. Okay, well. It's not complicated, I'm sure, but more tell them. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not, but again, there's a good story around this. Yeah. So the, the, the first one I came across, <clears throat> friend of mine, uh, Tony Reinders. Mm -hmm. Tony used to be the winemaker at Domain Serene, and he's gone on to some great things. And I, we were at a at a meeting or something together once, and he walks up with a bottle, just like I did. With, you can see what it was, and he poured it. What do you think about it? And I thought, wow, that stuff's great. What What is it? Pinot Noir. Oh, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And um, they call it there. They still make it. It's really great. It's called uh, Cor Blanc, so white heart. Okay. And I said, how do you do that? And he says, well, I can't tell you how to do it. And then wink, wink. He says, you can, you can <laughs> you find it on out. the internet, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. Just think about it. And so I did. I thought about it and tried it. First year was 2009. And the way I approach it, and, and you can do it different ways. The way I approach it is I go into my very finest Pinot Noir vineyard, and I pick mm -hmm. the same day that I'm going to pick to make a red Pinot Noir from that same single vineyard. Mm -hmm. Now, as you all know, Pinot, Pinot Noir is a pretty thin skin variety. Mm -hmm. So when you get something that's close to ripeness, the skins are pretty soft, and you're trying to make a white wine out of that. So I put the clusters into the press and just gently start to press and just watch the juice drip into the juice pan. And it starts off kind of clear and colorless. And then there's a point where it starts to turn pink because the skins are getting pressed. Right, yeah. And that's when I make the press cut. Take that juice and then ferment it as though it was a Chardonnay. Now, the bean counters never ask for permission to do this. <laughs> uh, the bean counters hate it because you only get about half of the yield of what you could have gotten had you made a red wine out of it. Because if you press too hard, it turns out pink and it makes a rose. Nothing wrong with that. But if the intent is to make a white wine, boom. And so that's where that came from. Now, you could approach it as though you're making um, a sparkling wine base yeah. and, and pick it early okay. when the skins are still firm and the acid's up. And it's a lot easier to do it that way. But I've never enjoyed doing things the easy way. Okay. And so what we call ours, it's called um, Leisure Magique. So that's the magic day. Okay. So, so like, the difference with using sparkling wine is that because the – the, the skins aren't as soft, you, you can get more juice out of it. You can press it a little harder and not get the color. Exactly. You can press it a little harder. The color's not as developed at that stage. Okay, yeah. Um, but you're going to pay the price in acidity. The acidity is usually pretty high. Right, yeah. Um, but if you want to do it and make a, a, a richer, more voluptuous wine, um, do it this way. Yeah. And so you'll see a number of them out there. There's more people doing it. Yeah, I know that. Um, so friends of mine, Posted uh, a different winery. They 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 had a picture of a white Pinot Noir, and I was like, "Well, I'm going there." So uh, it's Left Coast. I'm going to Left Coast. Oh, Left Coast. They do a good so, job. Yeah. So um, uh, they posted a picture, or they sent me a pic. They sent me a picture. Like they just posted. They sent to me. It's like, look what we're having. I was like, I'm going to be there. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's my first experience with white Pinot Noir. I mean, okay, yes, I know Blanc de Noir. Yes, we already covered that. But because I'm like, well, yeah, this should be pretty easy to make that but i didn't know how you do it out here because or how you do it specifically because i'm like like you said if you're gonna do it like champagne or sparkling wine um yeah the acidity is gonna be really high and that's it's great for sparkling but not so great that's necessarily exactly for drinking yeah 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 so this is okay i make if i'm lucky 200 cases of that oh wow there's not an enormous broad market for something like that and economically if you're a grape grower that it's the money's in pinot noir as a red variety yeah uh, especially when you only get half the yield off of that ton of grapes so what happens with the so what happens so after you've done that 
what do you do with those grapes? Then I keep the press going and just squeeze the heck out of it. And so everything that comes out after that is pretty red-ish. Okay. And so with that enormous Oregon tier Pinot Noir we make, that little tiny drop goes into the big ocean. It gets okay. used, but it gets used at a lower tier. Okay, yeah. So it's not like I dump it. Right, yeah, but yeah, But it yeah. doesn't go into the $80 bottle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it, you're, you're adding a little extra color, a little... Not really complex, but you're adding you're adding you're adding something to that to that uh, other Pinot Noir. Uh, sort of, sort of, yeah, yeah. Not it's a such lot. a small. It, it worked, you know, this this is two hundred cases. Yeah, the amount of that that remains is about two hundred cases, and that gets blended into what amounts to two hundred thirty thousand cases. Yeah, so, so it's, it's not. Just like, it's like it's like a dash of salt. It's a dash. Yeah. Okay. Just a whisper. Just so you're using it, basically. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Don't dump Instead it. of throwing it out. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> the bean counters might not be happy they with go, that. Wait a minute. <laughs> right. No, this is cool. I like that. Oh, how'd you like it? Yeah. And it's uh, it's something. It's uh, again, it's only available here in that in the tasting room or okay. in our club. Got it. Got it. Rosé. Yeah. Let's do that rosé here. Right. I'll hand that over to you. Thank you. This would be the 2018. 100% Pinot Noir. Okay. And the process I use here is, here I picked the Pinot Noir a little on the earlier side as though it were a base wine for sparkling wine. Okay. Uh, maybe around 20 to 21 and a half bricks. Okay. So the whole berries or the whole clusters go into the press. We squeeze it, take that juice, ferment it like I would with the other two white wines, stainless steel, okay. bottled early. Nice. And it's dry. So I definitely get, uh, you know, the strawberry on there. I mean, it's because the last one, uh, Rosé I had earlier today, I got some watermelon, and I mentioned that I haven't gotten watermelon and Rosé a lot recently, mm -hmm. but I kind of get just, it's, theirs was more watermelon than, <laughs> than like strawberry or anything like uh -huh. that. This one's more strawberry than, than watermelon, oh, yeah. but this it's like a, it's a little bit in there. Yeah, early on, just after I bottle it, there's more melon there. Yeah. There are really just some red berries in there too, you know, not just not just a strawberry and a, and a watermelon, but like, like you know, just a. I want to say like not say cherry, but like, like just red berries. Mm -hmm. like, I, you know, I, I don't know how to no, describe these saying, things, yeah. and, and that sometimes that's all I can cover just mm -hmm. describe it because it's more yeah, like, like a, a amalgamation of of, yeah. of red. Red, red, red. Yeah, yeah, but uh, um, red, red raspberry. -ish. Yeah, kind of more raspberry than anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. And this is, uh, probably find it retail for under 14. Mm -hmm. Just easy to drink, really pleasant. Um, I'm the kind of person that will drink rosé any time of the year. I don't, it doesn't yeah. have to be hot outside. Yeah, it's too. You know, it could be... I, so the problem when I do when I do two interviews in one day, I tend to and, and we have the similar wines. I tend to repeat myself, <laughs> but you didn't hear it, so it doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> but um, but it could be. I, I said the same thing on the last interview. It could be February. I could drink rosé, which is you know, and yes, that's my that's my view. I I it doesn't have to be a certain time of year to drink mm -hmm. uh, any particular wine, but yes, some times of year are a little bit better than others. They oh, yeah. seem more appropriate. For us at home, it's oftentimes just kind of that glass you start with before we go somewhere else. And yeah, it, it yeah. It could be tonight or it could be in the middle of summer. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I like this one. Thank you. Very nice. So um, when we were talking about the, the vineyards, you had said that um, in the 90s, they got hit with phylloxera, right? Yeah, it, it, and the phylloxera probably was always here. 
mm -hmm. uh, and was brought by the pioneers and the wagon trains on uh, Concords that they brought over here. So okay. it's probably been here that long. Okay. Uh, but originally they thought that we wouldn't be bothered by phylloxera because it was too wet and cool. Well, pulled our head out of the sand when in 1990 we started seeing signs suggesting phylloxera and then we had the vineyards analyzed and it certainly was. Now, if there's good news out of this, it doesn't spread as fast as it spread in California, mm -hmm. but it eventually takes your vineyard down. So some of the older vineyards around here, are they're going down. It's sad to see. Um, yeah. But the bright light is when they were planting vineyards back in the 70s and 80s, they were planting them very widely spaced and, and really with odd row orientation. It was more like a California um, table grape growing uh landscape okay. uh, and it allowed us now to tear those vineyards out the diseased ones and replant with newer clones mm -hmm. new selections and yeah. maybe change up our row orientation or how we space and it gives us other opportunities that we were locked into before okay uh, so there is a bright light but yeah it's here and it's 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 going and you're not going to stop it period. yeah Exactly. We do have, and we'll have that wine here a little bit later, we do have one four-acre vineyard way across the valley from here that is so isolated. It goes back to 1983, and there's no phylloxera yet. It just... It just hasn't gotten there yet. It will. Yeah, at some point. Somebody's it's, it's going to It'll be on somebody's shoe, and they'll... Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, there's... I, uh, I think it's Hinchke in Australia. If you're going to visit them, they want to know where you went first, because they are trying to prevent any flocks from hitting there. Yeah. So they tell you, see them first and then go elsewhere instead of seeing them last. <laughs> Something like that. I think it's Hedgegate. I forgot who it is. No, it's, yeah. it, you just think about it. And that's how a lot of the flocks are up here in the hills got spread. It showed up. And where you first saw it was on the border of the vineyard. Okay. And it's on the border of the vineyard where the workers come and they congregate before they go out into the vineyard or it's where the picking bins are yeah. that get dumped into that have mud on them that travel around. And it used to be, since we were such a cooperative group, that people used to share equipment. Yeah. And so it just literally got dragged around. Yeah. yeah. It's not, not hard for that to happen. Nope. So uh, we didn't talk about it, but row orientation. So how do you, what, what type of orientation do you try to do out here I mean, the hills are all over. I mean, I, you know, um, are, are you trying to do an east-west and north-south orientation, or it just kind of depends on, on where you're at? It, it yeah, I hate to say it, but it does kind of depend on where you're at, and okay. also what the climate's doing. Okay. And when I started down here uh, in '88, <clears throat> they thought you were crazy if you planted above 750 feet because it was too cool and exposed. And now I'm looking for vineyards that are at 750 feet and above. In fact, one of our estate vineyards is at 1,000 feet. Yeah. I'm actually also looking for vineyards that are not south facing, that are more east facing and potentially even northeast really? facing. Really? Okay. So we can avoid that late afternoon hot, hot sun because let's think, Let's face it, it is warmer, and yeah. Pinot Noir does not like that. So we're having to kind of rethink how we approach vineyard layouts and also siting a vineyard up here. Okay. And just a matter of how you change how the rows go, not north and south, but maybe 20 degrees off, okay. how that can change how light hits the vine in the hot part of the day okay. is really becoming a significant feature that you okay. need to pay attention to. But it used to be north-south, that's because... That's how the fences ran, you know, north-south. Yeah. Or you go into some vineyards that were kind of sloped to the east. Well, you run them east-west because it's easier to get your tractor up and down. I mean, that, that was yeah. the early day thinking. But, makes sense. Um, makes know. total sense. Yeah. yeah, if you're a farmer, right? Yeah. Uh, so you see a little of everything, mostly north-south, but we're looking for other things. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Um, and do you also work with your canopy management as far as like, you know, for your, you know, protecting the grapes and all that kind of stuff. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. In addition yeah. to your orientation. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, exposure, uh, <laughs> too much exposure is not a good thing. Uh, applies to many parts of a person's life. Yeah. Uh, but in grape growing, and especially with Pinot Noir, the color molecule in Pinot Noir, the anthocyanin, is different than anything else. It's very, very delicate and actually will degrade. Really? Okay. If it gets too hot, and if you're a dark berry, 
out in the sun, you get so hot you can actually bleach color. Okay. We've all heard about sunburn, that's one thing, but we can actually degrade the anthocyanin and Pinot Noir, so we're really, really careful about how the afternoon sun, the hottest part of the day, hits the vine. So we might leaf strip a little tiny bit just to allow airflow and ventilation, yeah. but not so much that it's overexposed. Okay. So is, a Pinot Noir, is, that's more susceptible for degrading, whereas maybe stuff like Cab, it's going to just build up the anthocyanins? It's to... much, much less susceptible to that. Okay, yeah. yeah. And, and then again, with Pinot Noir being such a thin-skinned variety, we're always worried about disease. Mm -hmm. And the worst disease would be mildew, and worse than that is botrytis bunch rot. Right, yeah. So we need to have the canopies relatively open so that when it does get wet, and yeah, it gets wet every once in a yeah. while up here, right? that it does have the chance to dry out and mm -hmm. not become really a trap for humidity. Okay. Fine, Got it. It's a fine balance. Fine balance here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cause it's so wet around here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, what else, what else we have here? Well, let's uh, move on to Pinot Noir. Yeah, let's do that. So this is the Oregon Pinot Noir. Okay. And again, most of the fruit is North Willamette Valley and a bit is also from the Umpqua Valley in Southern Oregon. Okay. 2017 vintage. And this is the wine. Well, I think I said it already. It's the 230 to 250,000 cases. Half okay. the gray hairs from that. Right, yeah. Because uh, it's got to be great all the time. So far, so good. And really, that's this is the wine that built the Erath reputation. Uh, when Dick started, his philosophy was you know, I, I want to present a good wine at a good value because nobody had heard of Pinot Noir. So it had to be good and it had to be affordable just to get people to try it. Right. And we've kind of stuck with that concept. Yeah. No, I think this is good. I mean, it's got, you know, it's definitely more of a, it's, there's more fruit than earth on this one, but that's the style. And that's, yeah. I think that's a really good approachable style. Um, you know, the cherries in there. Uh, it's a little bit riper, um, but there's a little bit of drier cherry in it too. Can you even touch a cinnamon for me in this? Smooth, easy to drink, you know. And that's what we're shooting for. Yeah, and this is around the 15 to 16. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and this is a wine. It's kind of deceptive. It looks a little light in color, but I, I don't care what my Pinot looks like. I want it to look like that. I want it to 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 be able to see through it and j just attract you into it. It doesn't right. need to be hanky. Yeah. But what it needs to be, or our style is, I want you, if you pull that bottle off the shelf like most people do, they open it that night, and it has got to be smooth. No rough edges. Yeah. You do not have to lay that wine down to get over a rough spot. Okay. But I'm still pulling out 2003 and 2004s, the very first year we went to the screw cap, and those wines are still alive. Yeah. So. And there you go, screw cap, right? Oh, did I say screw cap again? Yeah, did you say screw cap? Yeah. Yeah, I see that cinnamon you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, when you get, at least for me, when you get into tasting and you, you start talking about color, you start, you start kind of seeing or tasting other things of the same color, you know? So cinnamon, I have the, I have the association with red, more like with red hots. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, so the cinnamon, so you have that red hot, so I have to, I, I, red fruits and then you have the cinnamon. So then. In your head, you go, well, it's red hot, and then sometimes you're just going down a rabbit hole, and then you might be kind of painting yourself into a corner because uh -huh. it happens all the time in blind tasting. Because <laughs> what happens is you go, in your head, you're not supposed to do this. In your head, you're like going, you start smelling it, and you start tasting it, and you start in your head going, I know what it is. Instead of just going, what's in the wine, and then listen to what you say, and then when you hit your initial conclusion, kind of go, what I said can only be these grapes and from these areas instead you sometimes go smell it taste i'm like yeah i'm pretty sure i know what this is and then you start describing the wine based upon what you think it is and that was actually in the wine right yeah no, i'm I not could... saying you're lying you're making stuff up yeah but you start seeing these things in there and you start going yeah but 
but yeah, so the cinnamon, I was like, I got some cinnamon. Then in my head, I was like, red hot. I'm like, no, that's not really a red hot. It's more of a cinnamon. It's not <laughs> not like that. Not like that really like strong, powerful, like like candy red hot. It was, but like a little bit of cinnamon there. But yeah, it, but I hit my head, I associate cinnamon with red. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, it kind of is red. It's more of a brown, brown, red, auburn, something like that. Yeah. But yeah, I like that. All right. Next. So. This is a wine I call a state selection, and it's exactly that. It's a selection from certain states to try to recreate the wine style of Oregon that I fell in love with. Okay. And those were the wines that came out of the, the, the 70s and early 80s when it still really was a cool climate. Mm -hmm. You know, so trying to trying to hit a spot here. So okay. this is me vineyard cherry picking and also barrel cherry picking. And what I'm finding as the years get warmer and warmer, I'm having to go to those higher and higher elevations okay. where it might be four degrees cooler on average. Um, and, and so it retains the, the acidity and the fresh fruits. Okay. Not the cooked, but in a little more of that red fruited profile. So that's a state selection. And this one, um, I may make 2,500 to 3,000 cases okay. if I'm lucky. Two thousand sixteen vintage. I like that. I like, love it. This That's... is I mean, this is really that kind of style that I, I really do like. You know, it's on the it's it's on the fruitier side of things, mm -hmm. but we're not talking like California, you know, Pinot Noir that has Petit on it. Did I say that? What? <laughs> anyway, I'm not saying names because uh, they claim it's 100 percent Pinot Noir. Um, but um, <laughs> but the yeah, sign says that in the vineyard. <laughs> well, yeah, um, but yeah, this is on that on on the more the fruit side of things mm -hmm. rather than the earthy side. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, this is this is something I would bring to a, a, a blind tasting. Like like, here you go. You better say Oregon. So sometimes, <laughs> some, but sometimes I I get some like examples. Okay, testable's not Anderson Valley, but like sometimes you get some Russian River examples that that have this this type of profile to it. But if I get this in a wine, I'm I'm going Oregon. I'm like it's Oregon, mm -hmm. you know. But I've been surprised every once in a while that the person is going for this style, but they're in California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I have uh, close to 170 individual blocks of Pinot Noir. Most okay. of them are North Willamette Valley, and so I have a lot to choose from. Mm -hmm. And a certain percentage of those we farm explicitly for a single vineyard, and it's from those I cherry pick to create that. Okay, so it's kind of like a like a mixture. It is. Uh, it's a mixture of those things. So. It's not a mixture of all of them. It's uh, whatever it takes to hit that style and that vintage. Okay. So this year, I think it's uh, five or six, but they're higher elevation spots. All right. And so when you're doing that, um, when you're we're doing your blending trials, is this it's a lot? It's a lot of trial and error. Do you kind of know from year to year what you probably should focus on? There, there are three vineyards that year in and year out um, come to those qualities just on their own. Okay. Uh, and so I always look there first, uh, but then occasionally you're surprised. Okay. Uh, and, and when it's a cool vintage overall, it, I don't want to say it, but it's kind of easy because most of all of your high tier performs that way. But when it's a warmer vintage, elevation and exposure makes all the difference. Okay. And then it's those three vineyards that really stand out. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it depends. All right. Cool. Tri trial and error. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like you have a formula. You're like every year it's going to be these yeah. five things. Right. You know, that'd be entirely too easy. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'd be doing something else. I'd go back to pharmacy practice. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I got asked earlier today. Whatever. Go back to restaurants. I'm like, probably not. Yeah. It have to be too good of a deal. It just I, I enjoy where I'm at. Right. Um, or the, or the, the part of the industry I'm in way too much right now. So yeah, yeah, I yeah. hear you. Hear you. <laughs> After all these years, back to Willakaya Vineyard. Okay. So that's that Amity area vineyard, the one mm -hmm. that faces the coastal corridor. Okay. It's 2014. 
This is one complicated vineyard in that it's 120 acres of vines split up into 48 individual blocks. Okay. 48. Elevation from 350 to 860. 48 little, little pieces. Okay. And from those pieces, sort of a similar concept as to a state selection, I go in and pick and choose from a certain area, which I believe best expresses that vineyard. Okay. Some of the oldest planting there. So before I even get into the wine itself, um, so in that particular scenario, in how this vineyard is, um, is it similar as far as similar concept where like you say you're in Burgundy and you're on the slopes that a certain area is going to give you, not necessarily in this case, the middle area, but a certain area of, of the vineyard is going to give you your better fruit and then other areas are not always going to be the same quality or is it just kind of, it just, or is it every year it just kind of depends what it gives you? <clears throat> it's, it's one of the things, it's fixed because it is a site that exists in the universe. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Yeah. And when we first contemplated buying it, I spent eight hours on an ATV going up and down every row and the leaves were off. This was in the winter. And so just from doing that, I got a sense that there was one area and it's in the middle where there's sort of a bench. Okay. Gradual slope. And you just stood there and it, I know it sounds really weird, but there was just a feel. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and then there was also some visual um, uh, observations there that when I looked at all the trunks, they all were of equal diameter. Okay. And the canes that still existed were all of equal length and diameter. And that speaks to me that here is an area that is consistently one thing. Not that you have to have that, but that, that tells you something, that the soil is uniform. Okay. okay. And so, yay. Well, then it starts to grow and you make wine out of it and you find out that's either true or false. And in this case, it, it was, was true. true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So this, this center area just really outperforms the others. Not like the other areas are bad. They're just good at something else. Mm -hmm. Like Some of the lower areas are a little good for production that helps support that Oregon tier Pinot Noir. I mean, it's, it's juicy fruit and yay. And these ones are a little, a little more muscular, mm -hmm. uh, a little denser wine. There's a little more savoriness to it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this is starting to approach more of, of more of the... Burgundian style, there's, I, I'd almost say this is almost like a, a Cote de Nui. There's a little savoriness, not quite meatiness, but there's a little more power to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like, it's not like a super powerful, like Jevry Chambertin, but you know, you're, you're getting into that. You're mm -hmm. getting into that. It's not, it's not a, it's not a Cote d'Or. I mean, it's not Cote de Bone because Cote d'Or is both. It's not, it's not a Cote de Bone, but it's more of a Cote de Nui, mm -hmm. that extra structure, a little extra power to it, a little more density. Yeah. Uh, a little more savoriness to it, yeah. Yeah, and that's and that's what that section has going for it. There's five individual blocks in that flat, semi-flat area, and I, mm -hmm. they do that. <clears throat> I rarely have to go outside that small little area to bring in a component to do that. <laughs> nice, I like that one. So this one again, maybe a thousand. Thousand cases ish, okay. and and this is uh, retailing for it's either fifty or sixty. Okay. And I feel that's a really good price for that. Yeah, well, I think all of our. And again, I'm not saying any of your prices weren't good, but I'm just like. Yeah. But in my head, I'm like, I'm thinking this is probably more of a 70, 70 75 dollar you said 50 to 60 i'm like well, that's, a, that's a good price for that yeah and that has been you know that was dick's philosophy like i explained and saint michelle when they bought the place yeah you know they've done nothing except help me improve the quality and they haven't hiked the prices right yeah okay it seemed to work yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i agree with you we could yeah there's certainly more expensive wine of that yeah. quality out there yeah i'm not saying they need to it's just if they did <laughs> if they did I wouldn't, I just, wouldn't be like, just are you be crazy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get a cut. They do. No, that's right. <laughs> we weren't supposed to talk about that. Oh, damn it. <laughs> uh, moving on. Yeah, moving on. I'm just trying to, just, okay, let's go on to the, let's go on to Leland. Okay. Remember I was okay. talking about that uh, four acre vineyard way away from here that doesn't have phylloxera that, yeah. I, that I know of. 
Right. Oh, that's this vineyard. It's called Leland. It's a four acre vineyard that we have exclusively uh, ever since the first vintage, which was 1987. And the vineyard was planted in 1983. So these are all self-rooted pomard selection, actually taken from cuttings that Dick had. But you want to talk about off the beaten path. Yeah. Uh, it, it's 20 miles over towards the Cascades. So it's cooler over there. It's wetter over there. The vineyard is almost perfectly flat. It's like, what? These are not good things, right? Uh, and it, but it is on the red jury soil like we have here in the Dundee Hills. However, cool, wet, flat doesn't add up. When I first saw that vineyard in 2003, when I got this job and went over there, I thought this is going to be horrible. Every year, it makes single vineyard quality, and it's only because of the man that lives there, type A guy, also a scientist, hand positions every shoot. It is so well manicured. No, I kid you. Not. This is like right out of the wine spectator. Yeah. If it was in anybody else's hands, it would be average. Yeah. But every year. <clears throat> So on this one, call me crazy, but I get like a little salinity on this. It's like it's almost like a fresh ocean spray a little bit, you know? Um, or the, maybe it's, there's a freshness to it, and I'm associating that with something like that, but... It tends to have, year in and year out, the highest natural acidity of any of the pinots we make. In fact, a lot of times the pH is closer to a white wine pH after ML. <clears throat> my pH is right. So like a three, seven, three, eight, something like that? Um, more like three, five or three, three four. four. Oh, three, five. Wait a minute. Yeah, like our oh. Chardonnays. The that's right. Lower pH, higher acid. God, I, yeah, I reversed yeah, yeah. it. I reversed <laughs> it. Like I knew it too. You aren't the only one. We'll forgive you. Oh, man. I guess I'm not going to UC Davis, no, <laughs> <laughs> or wherever else. No, I did know that because, yeah, because like when you get like sparkling wine production, you're like doing three, two, three, three, or even lower, maybe even mm -hmm. three, one, three. Rieslings sometimes you're in that lower, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> and, and this is just that site, yeah. Um, there, and that's have... probably what I'm associating the solidity, but it's more of a freshness, mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a brightness, there's a lift to yeah. it, yeah, yeah, because, yeah, because of the acidity. And that wine will live forever. Uh, the the very first vintage was in '87, <clears throat> and we had the the was it the the master masters of wine, the masters of wine group, right? They, okay. They came to Oregon and Washington, and they wanted us to put on a show, and so I was on the pioneer committee, right? Mm -hmm. Again with Jason Lent. Uh, and everybody looked at me and said, do you have any more of that 87 Leland? I went, wow, no. It's like we totally don't have any. Uh, but uh, one of the winemakers here, the guy's retired, Myron Redford, okay, uh, who had Amity. Myron would go around and buy a case every year from all of his buddies. And he was buddies with Dick. So I, I found Myron. The guy's retired. And I called him up and asked him, do, do you have any? He said, well, let me check my inventory. I've got nine bottles. Uh, great. So I'm just thinking he's going to like donate these nine bottles for a good cause. Yeah. No. Yeah, it took a little arm wrestling and a little, you know, <laughs> this, but, but I got them. But then I had no idea if they were any good. Right. Uh, so I did sacrifice one with uh, Corbin and the wine was still alive. But it gets back to that kind of story about Andre. Seriously, you poured that wine in 20, 30 minutes. It was just right, bleep, yeah. gone. But 87, first vintage, 87 was a hot vintage. First vintage, hot vintage, and until a year and a half ago, it was still alive. Yeah, that's pretty That's good. amazing. Yeah. But it anyway, wasn't a screw cap, was it? <laughs> <laughs> it would have been so much better. It would, that, would have been, that would have been awesome. It was, and it was screw cap. That would, have been the, that would have been the best. That would have been the best on this story. I seriously love screw cap. I really do. <laughs> but not just from a ease of use thing. I just, I just think it's, um, I just think you're, you have a more of a guarantee of, of not something going wrong. At least, I mean, if it was poorly made, that's one thing and nothing's mm -hmm. going to help you, but, um, you have less chance of, of, 
issues with cork, not just cork tape, but just all the other issues with cork than you do anything else. But I mean, there's so many things going wrong with wines. You could you could have heat damage. I mean, you could yeah, you could have heat damage. Just and that that doesn't matter what you have. You're just going to get it anyway. Um, you got poor wine making. You know, you could have, which includes a lot of stuff. You could have just not. You could have not put enough SO2 in it, and it just it, you had bacterial stuff and fermentations, and you know again the, uh, the closure doesn't do anything for that. It takes out one of the variables that causes yeah. the most heartache. It does to yeah. me. You know, we have one chance a year to hit it out of park. Somebody comes in and buys a Leela and lays it down for six years or seven or ten or whatever, and they go to open it, and it's tainted. Yeah. Or it was um, it was too it, w- it had too many fissures in it and it let in too much oxygen. Yeah, it's a crapshoot. Let's face it, corks are a crapshoot. Yeah, and then if it is that long, um, we get into like that ten year time frame. My experience is that <clears throat> I'm better safer than sorry to use my Durand or also than using a corkscrew because that cork very likely will will just start coming apart. Yeah, and um, it's not, it, it's just more of a pain. So like, <laughs> it's more of a pain. It's, it's really anything else. It's more of a pain. You're, you're always filter in company. It I got it. Yeah. And people are, you're just, look, you're the sweat. psalm. You can't open, yeah, I can open yeah. a bottle of wine. Yeah, just <laughs> excuse yourself. Yeah, you know. And come back. I don't have to cant it, filter it out. Like, just, psh, boom, it's open. Yeah. Exactly. Magic. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, are we, are it, we done? Oh, uh, well, one oh, more. We have one more? Wait, one more. All right. You have time for one more. I got time for one more, yeah. Oh, bingo. Night's Gambit, another one of our state vineyards. And from here, it's about a quarter mile as the crow flies, but it's at a thousand feet elevation. Okay, cool. And in a warm year like 2016, that's not such a bad thing. Okay. Now this vineyard uh, faces primarily east. So we're not, we're not fighting that hot afternoon sun. Right. Okay. So again, we have relatively high natural acidities, but really bright, fresh red fruit profile. I even get like a little like darker fruit, not just the red, but a little bit of some black fruit in this. Mm-hmm. You know, there's something of richness to it. Oh, kind of a little current. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a. a a little richness to this. It's, it's it's not thick, but there's somewhat of a of a almost a syrup or a um, or a, or a jelly richness to it. You know, it, it there's it's just I'm not saying it's a big wine, but there's there's extra structure to it. Yeah, yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, it's juicier. It's juicier. It's juicier. juicier. Yeah. And this is uh, from a selection that, going back to Dijon, mm-hmm. uh, there's one of the Dijon clones called 777. And it in itself is a little earlier ripening, and it tends to give, if you grow it in the right spot, give you that juiciness okay. and that prettiness and, and a lot of floral in the aromas. Right. Uh, and we have, that's a small block up there, but this is from the 777 block. Okay. And then if you put it in, say, something that's going to be a cooler climate, then you can extend that. You can, yeah. you, you can extend the hang time oh, on it. Oh, yeah, exactly. Okay. And, and that's kind of one of the strategies is not just elevation, but clone selection. Yeah. And rootstock. Well, yeah, we didn't talk about rootstock. Um, again, I'm not an expert in, in all this. I mean, I, I know a couple of rootstocks here and there. Do you, Are your vineyards primarily planted on a particular rootstock or do you just kind of have – are you just trying to match the right rootstock with the right – clone variety in, in your site selection? We're, uh, we're trying to match the rootstock more to the site okay. and not necessarily to the clone. Okay. Because there are some uh, rootstocks that are really, really devigorating. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, if you're in a droughty situation and you don't think of Oregon as being dry, but in the summer, we're in drought. I mean, that's more often than not. So if you have these um, low drought tolerant uh, rootstocks and you're on top of that, then the vine can get so stressed it collapses. Okay. But we might use that, that particular rootstock in a little more moist uh, area of the vineyard. Okay. So we know enough to match rootstocks mainly to where you are and not so much about what clone is on top okay. of it. Got it. All right. So there's like three or four that we kind of hang our hats on. Okay.
I was explaining to Gary earlier that I, I like to listen to Jim Dwayne's Inside Winemaking podcast because he's a winemaker at CV. And so he gets all technical. So I like to listen to it to like try to make myself smarter. So, or try to act smarter, like talk intelligently to people like him. So I sound like I know what I'm talking about without like sounding like I'm full of shit. What? Well, I guess the explicit tag's going on there now. <laughs> bleep. But yeah, uh, no, I won't bleep it out. It'll be in there. All so, right. but uh, yeah. I just, uh, I just make it up as I go along, too, you know. Well, so do I. Right. <laughs> It seems like every trip I do something different, you know, in, in how I do things. So, um, so you see, I don't have the iPad open. I didn't have it open the last show either. That's because Filmic Pro, I hate you, isn't working. But I'm using the Moment app. So you guys rock because they make cool lenses. And they're, they're up in Washington. They're up in Seattle. Well, one of them is up in Washington. The other one kind of lives in California. But I want to meet those guys because they're all the photography stuff. But that's a sidetrack. Um, yeah, I got, I got a couple others if you're interested. Little, we, little yeah, we totally. I I've got wanna... time. I'm, I I still have a little bit left in here to to I still have a little bit, I still have a little room left. <laughs> <laughs> I still got a little room left. Yeah, uh, it's still a thirteen. All right, a thirteen mentioned gray hair. Thirteen is the other half of the gray hair. Yeah, right. Because we got a lot of precipitation just before some of the vineyards were ripe. Okay. So my production was down at least 30% in 13 because rot started. And uh, the last thing I want to do is bring in rotten fruit into the vine or into the winery. And so we left and others a lot of fruit out in the vineyard. And this was one of them that's actually clone 777 in okay. a warmer, warmer pocket. Okay. So it ripened. I haven't done this for a while. Stand back, everybody. I got it. So I actually have one of these and I use these on all my reviews because I tend to, um, and my viewers know because I wear the same shirt for like seven episodes in a row. I, I, I tend to record like five, six, seven, eight episodes in one sitting. So that means I'm, I'm doing anywhere from five to eight wines to, I don't know, 10 to 16 wines in a, in a sitting. That's a bunch. Yeah, so uh, since I've gotten the Corbin, I'm able to do that with no problem and not have to feel like I have to drink all the wines in five days <laughs> with, with vacuum So well, it's, well, it's been done. Vac vacuum right? and putting everything in the refrigerator, which there's no oh, room then for anything else. Right. So I love, I love this thing. So this vineyard so, is yeah. called Niederberger. It's a Dundee okay. Hills vineyard. Uh, and so from here, we're sitting at about 700 feet. This one is right about 400 feet, which is the line where the volcanic sto soil start. All right. Red jury soil. Yeah. So it's just... <laughs> In a kind of a hot pocket. This said it was thirteen, right? Thirteen. So you can definitely see a little little color changing on this too. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of a little bit of browning on it, and you can kind of smell it too. A little you smell a little oxidation on it. I like that. So, on the nose, not just the oxidation, but there was there was a little bit of that raisinated fruit, mm -hmm. like you can get from like say like a Valpo or Amarone or like sure. something. Yeah, totally. Um, but on the palate, it doesn't have that. Not really. I mean, it's it's more just um, more earthy and um, uh, yes, it's, it's more earthy than anything else than than really like any type of raisinated fruit. But, um, and there was something else. <clears throat> and there, there's a touch of that in there too, but it's, it's aging and it's aging really well. And you've gotten a little of that complexity from that. And, um, I like this one a lot. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, it's one of our faves for a lower elevation, hot pocket. Yeah. And 13, you know, until the big rain events hit, 13 was a record-breaking heat year up until that point. Okay. Hmm. There's a little bit of spiciness to it. And it, it kind of really kind of tastes a little like an older burgundy, which 
It used to be a broken record for the next like eight episodes that I'm going to like, compare this <laughs> wine to Burgundy, but but that's what Oregon is. It's it's really that crossroads of new and old world, and you're going to have some wines that kind of tow the Burgundy line, some that tow the New World line and line, mm -hmm. and you know that's that's what's kind of cool about the wines from here. It so, is. Yeah. It's a blast. Nice. Every year is different. Okay, final. Yeah, we can do one more here. One more. This All right. wine is uh, called La Nuit Magique, the Magic Night. Magic Night. And so this one is a wine that Dick started making before I got here. Uh, and it's it's kind of in honor of that one, that special occasion that you had when you first went, whoa, there is something to this Pinot thing. And for me, it was that dinner I had with Andre and he yeah. brought that burgundy and I just went, what? So it's it's was Dick trying to recreate that wine in his mind, and this one is me trying to recreate that wine in my mind. Okay. Uh, and so, like the estate selection in, in uh, the Willakaya, I'm selecting. It's this is like the total geek out cherry pick. You never know where it's going to come from. Okay. Some years it happens. Yeah. Some years it doesn't. And this is 2011, and 2011 was the very latest growing season we ever had. And quite literally, we were finishing at Prince Hill November 2nd. Oh, wow. Yeah. And and the, all the fruit from this vineyard comes from one of my coolest vineyard sites. Okay. So coolest vintage, coolest site. Okay. So as comparison, when did you get the fruit this year? Because I know this is a cooler year. Um, so in, in reference point... Uh, so from the very warmest to the very coolest, let's use Leland as an example. In 2011, Leland came in on October 31st. Hmm. Okay. okay. And our hottest year, 2015, it came in on September 20th. That's uh, over four weeks. Yeah. That's how different it can be. So this year, cooled down a great deal going into harvest. So in terms of harvest timing, it's very, very similar to last year. Okay. Even though it looked like it was going to be ahead, it cooled down. And that's the neat thing about that, cooling down instead of harvesting in the heat. You get flavor and tannin development at lower bricks level. And okay. I love that. And this is an example of that. Okay. And you're retaining the acidity because it's it, it got cooler, so you're not you're not dropping acid. Yeah, the acid doesn't drop out. Um, uh, it changes. Mm -hmm. uh, the malic acid still goes away, but the acid doesn't totally drop out. The pHs don't shoot up, but more importantly, the flavor development continues, but the bricks development really sort of ceases, which okay. is fine. Because the last thing we want to do is to have to pick because the sugar's too high. Okay. When I can get into a cool year and, and you can just long hang time under cool conditions, I'll take it every year. We just haven't been getting every year. So like, so here's here's a little thing. So this is an 11 versus 13. And this one actually looks young mm -hmm. still. Like, you know, I, I don't see uh, the oxidation on it. And that's, I mean, when I swirl it, I can actually see more of the more of the the browning on it. But when I just when I just put it down here, it's not. It, 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 I don't see it as much as I saw in only two, you know, the two year younger one. It's there, but so this gets back to that. You know, what we were talking about a little earlier is there are some higher acid sites that I have year in year out. This is one of those. Okay, so even in a hot year, I can count on that having retained acidity. And that helps preserve color. Uh, and that's just how that vineyard is. But it takes a long time for it to get there. And if it happened to rain and you weren't ready for it, it yeah. could be a total wipeout. So I remember uh, Bob McCritchie used to be one of the first winemakers for Soko Blosser. And he's one of the people that when I was considering coming down here and doing this, uh, I stopped in and I saw him. And he, uh, I think he's still alive. But at the time, he called me young man. Right? Young man, yeah. And this is him talking to me. So, well, young man, there's something you need to know if you're going to come down and do that. And I said, what? And he says, well, first of all, you have to be prepared for the very worst scenario and do it every year. Every year. Because sometimes it's going to save your butt. Most years, it doesn't matter. 
but in year like 11 and 13, that's when you did everything right out in the vineyard and you spared no expense. It paid off and made fabulous wines. But if you cut corners, you had problems. And so what's the other thing, Bob? He says, oh, well, the other thing is this business is really hard on marriages. <laughs> I think he was like into his third by then. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, if, if, if you do all the right things in the tough vintages and don't screw it up in the winery. Yeah. So remember I was talking about like Cote de Nui and all that kind of stuff. So if I brought this to tasting group, they would probably think this is a, a literally a Cote de Nui, maybe even like a Jerry Chambertin or something like that, um, or a new St. George type of, of wine. Um, it's definitely more of the spice driven. Um, it's aged extremely well. Like, like I wouldn't call it a one to three year old wine, but I would probably yeah. – if I was gonna guess the vintage, so I'd probably put it at like fourteen rather than eleven. Mm -hmm. um, I'd probably put it on that you know that five to seven year range, um, not an eight year old. Which okay, so okay, I'm splitting hairs. It's it's, it's five to seven versus eight, but I'd be on the, more in the five or six rather than the seven or eight. But it it definitely has more. It definitely has the vibrancy to it. Um, it's the oxidation's there, but it's just. It's more about the complexity and the developing nature of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I'm not saying because it's the last wine that he – I think it's the last wine, right? Yeah. That's, that's, that's the last wine <laughs> and the last one is always the best wine. It's not always the best wine. <laughs> not for everybody. But my goodness, man. This is, you know, this is really nice. Oh, and yeah. Thank you. I'm swallowing it mainly because I'm, I'm kind of out of room here. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but it's also the last wine of our flight and the last wine of the day. So – it's okay if I Boom. enjoy what's Can left indulge. in this. Yeah. Shall we shall we cheers? Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is nice. It's even there's even so so I went New St. George and you know and Cotonoui, but the spices on it almost remind me of a little a cru beaujolais of a of a gamay. Oh. Um so if I actually would hit this in a blind, I probably would think this might be like a lighter, like Beaujolais, like something like a, a Fleury or something like that. Something that has a little bit of elegance, um, like brightness, lightness. It wouldn't. I wouldn't put this as a Morgan or or a a, a um, um, Moulin Avant that has the power and structure and, and, and depth to it, but. But if I was like, I think it's Pinot Noir because I'd probably take it to Pinot Noir. Um, I'd probably, I probably wouldn't go Jeffrey Chambertown, but I'd probably take New St. George or at least uh, Cote de Nuit. At least, <laughs> I'd at least say okay, you know, broad, broad say Cote de Nuit. And if it was more, more specific, I'd be like, cool. I just didn't want to like hang my hat on something that was a little more specific. But yeah, this is, and and so does that mean that I like Burgundy better than Oregon? Not necessarily, but I think of, of the ones we had, this is really good. And then the uh, the Willa, the Willakaya. That one's – they're all good, but yeah. yeah, those those are those little more standouts for me. This is great. Um, is there anything that we didn't cover? Um, I think we've covered most of the stuff we talked about prior to – there's most stuff that, that we want to talk about. Like, yeah, that can be talked yeah, about. Yeah, that can be talked about. You know, there's a few things that, you know, are, go there. cannot be said. But um, uh, no, not really. We didn't really talk about anything. <laughs> there, was, there was not much that we didn't already talk about. But is there anything that we maybe didn't or maybe uh, you want to say something about uh, we may not have uh, talked about? Well, nothing earlier? in particular except uh, maybe a little bit about the vintage that we just finished yeah. bringing, bringing in the door, the 2019 vintage, which, <clears throat> again, it's kind of weird. You know, you, you never know what's going to happen. But early in the season, it looked like it was a set up for another early year which has kind of been the way things have been. Right. Uh, and then uh, it cooled down. It cooled down as we just got into Verasion and it extended Verasion. Not what we were expecting, yeah. but again, if you're prepared for the worst situation, that we, right? Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like 13, we thought, wow, man, this is going great until something happened. It was sort of the same story here. Things were going great and then it cooled down and we all went, now what? Oh, okay, I guess we're just gonna wait. Yeah. 
and it was a waiting game that just turned out to be phenomenal. Similar to 2008 and somewhat to 11, when things cooled down, you still have to wait for flavor and color development. Mm -hmm. And you go, ooh, I hope it doesn't get wet. Well, it got wet. Yeah. It got wet several times. Not huge amount of wetness, but enough to make it humid and to make you worry about disease. Mm -hmm. And so this was one of those years where if you did everything right in the vineyard, high fives. If you didn't, there still is probably fruit hanging out there. But the cool part is slow bricks development. And there's a lot of fruit that I brought in that was 22, okay, maybe 22 and a half that has this intense color. The tannin is up, but it's good. It's good tannin. And it's got the acidity that reminds me of 11 and also 8. But it's, it's remarkable at color development, flavor development at low bricks. Really, is a godsend. Yeah. You know, and so I'm happy it cooled down. It makes a lot of people sweat bullets when you're thinking, oh, it's going to be an early harvest. I'll be in Hawaii in <laughs> September. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and this was the total reversal. Uh, yeah. And it was all about timing. Uh, and, and fortunately, we've, I'm talking to some other winemakers today, and we're just going, wow, that was scary, but it turned out great. Yeah. So when I was making all my arrangements, you know, I, I really wanted to be here like the first two weeks of November um, or the last week of October, November. I just couldn't make it work um, between, you know, what I do here and not here. Um, but, you know, I was like, okay, so I'll do the last two weeks of October. And I was like, man, I was like, I, I'd probably be okay, but I'm not really sure. And so I went to Texom and there was a, there was a woman, I think she already moved. She, she lived in Portland. I think she moved somewhere else uh, since then. And um, I said, yeah, I'm going to Oregon. And I'm like, I'm going last week of October. He's like, yeah, you're not going to Oregon. I'm like, why not? It's, it's harvest to be open? No, no, it's, 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 it's going to be longer. It's going to be, <laughs> it's gonna longer than we it's going to be an ender. It's going to be, it's going to be a longer harvest or you know, harvest going to end later. I was like, oh. I'd already, I mean, I'd already actually bought my plane tickets. I mean, I, I mean, I was committed. Like it was like, I made the decision. I'd done it. If I had waited after text on my mind, I'd been able to convince you know, other people to let me go like one more week later. But, um, but when I got here, you know, it seems like, I mean, of course I'm only my second appointment, but from the conversations I've had with you, uh, with Julie, and then, um, the wife of the winemaker for Marshall Davis, cause I went to the restaurant that's next door to them on Saturday. Uh -huh. Um, it seems like for the most part, things are ending right about the time I showed up. Yeah. And, totally. but when I was making these arrangements, people are going, yeah, we need you to be the last week of October because we're going to be still <laughs> harvesting like the week. You're first, I'm like, uh, yeah. So I made as many and so I made as many appointments at the end as I could, and then I was kind of like, okay, all I got left is you know these days, these days. And some people are like, no, you can come see us on Monday or Tuesday or whatever. You know, th this week. I was like, cool, I, I like that. But yeah, so I'm not saying I'm the reason that you know the harvest ended by the time I got here, but it, the timing <laughs> seemed to work out. I get lucky a lot of times. Um, just like I'm crossing the fingers that tomorrow morning, the weather will hold out like it did today to, for the morning. Mm, should. Um, that there was no rain and the wind was low enough because while I was doing the interview this morning, oh, the wind picked flying. up. Yeah. For the oh, flying yeah. in the morning. Yeah. It's going to be kind of fun. <laughs> so, um, so obviously I don't, you know, I don't have drone footage for this one because, well, I did an interview this morning and then of course at lunch I actually did have a glass of wine. So that right there automatically means I can't. Uh, and I did sip a little, I did swallow a little bit of the, from the first interview. But, um, while we were doing the interview, uh, we were behind, uh, there had, we had windows behind us and I could see like these tall, some type of tree and they were like, whoosh. so I'm looking at Julie and I'm, but in my corner, I see these trees going, whoosh. it was like in my head, I'm like going, man, if this was like an hour ago, I couldn't have done it. So if the drone, if the winds are the winds go above 30 miles an hour. It's, it's forget it. The drone can't, the drone itself can't handle it, oh, but that's just, but then you have to worry about gusts. So that's not even just a stain wind. So your stain wind needs to be kind of under 20 miles an hour. And I think it was like 15, 15 ish when we were doing it. Cause the drone was like, what? the whole yeah. time. So yeah. yeah. So I'm hoping to, hoping the weather, cause I thought I was going to get the drone footage at all today. I, because I all, all week, the last week was when I could start and see today's, today's forecast, it was rain you know, just rain itself. And yeah. then last night I saw it. It was like, like this little window this morning. 
And now tomorrow I'll have to look again. But when I looked earlier, it, there was no window. <laughs> but it might be. That's the rest of the week looks okay. The rest yeah. of the week looks okay, at least as far as my appointments. But yeah. Yay. So this has been this has been wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank Enjoy you so me. much. Uh, so folks, we're going to wrap this up. Um, so as always, you can click the links above and friend me up. I'll have links below uh, for the winery. Um, and uh, yeah, you should come out here. If you've never been out to this area, you should come out. Uh, check these guys out. You can hit the tasting room, contact them. Um, you know, this is one of those wineries where you don't have to, uh, where they can see people. Some wineries, you know, they you have to be a club member or whatever, but you can yeah. come up here. Um, you don't necessarily have to make an appointment. But, you don't have to. Uh, but you but always we could. do offer some special situations, yeah. special tastings, that type of thing. VIP yeah, you would actually do it in this room. Yeah. Right, right here. Right here. You do it right yeah. here where no we were lights. at. Yeah. Yeah, when I, when I when I got so there was a couple that had came up around the same. Well, I was saying the three people that came the same I did. Yeah. So they walk in and uh, they're like, "What's in that room over there?" And and one of the ladies <laughs> is like, "Well, that's like we have a special tasting going on, you know, industry, you know, meaning me." Um, but they're like, "Yeah, we have our clubs, you know, our our club members and all that." I was like, "That's right. You you, you make special arrangements. You might be able to taste in this room." We do some kind of cool stuff too. We do. Uh, we were talking about clones earlier from Molokai, mm -hmm. also Night's Gam, but we'll do. Uh, you can do a sit-down blending trial where we'll That's give cool. you all three components of the Molokai blend: the Pomard, the 115, uh, the 777, and and we'll have somebody take you through and you can do your own blending trial. It's really a blast. Yeah. So we offer a lot of experiences like that. But yeah, you don't need to make an appointment. Eleven till five every yeah. day. So I think it's five it o'clock. Oh my god. <laughs> It's 5.07. That means well, we just can the lights really are, drink. The lights are out over there. <laughs> so I, right. I looked up and the lights are off and yeah, there's no, no, yeah, no there's uh, parking lot. It's just yeah. empty. But that, that, and not to extend this any longer, but that's actually something eventually I'll, I'll try to do a blending with somebody. Somewhere along the line, I'll, I'll do a blending because I would, I would like to do that. Yeah. Today I got to, I reached into the, into the fermentation bins and I tasted Pinot Noir grape and Cabernet Franc grapes right out of the fermentation bin. That was a cool experience. So every trip I get to do something kind of cool that I've never done before. So, um, you know, and uh, oh yeah, I was going to try to do uh, fermentation stuff uh, this morning, but I'll, so one of these one of these visits, I'll I'll get something out of a, out of the yeah. out of the fermentation we tank. Have plenty of opportunities. That. We'll be here. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's again. That's going to wrap it up. Um, again, so links, links, and. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you all for stopping by, and we'll see everyone again next time.